Ed, could you tell me a little bit about your latest discovery related to uh, true units? Uh, yes, I, this just uh, occurred to me. I'm seeing it in an entirely different way than I have before uh, when working on, on writing up a, a chapter for the new academy mm -hmm. for uh, post-materialist science. And um, uh, it has to do with where quantum physics and relativity meet. And it has to do with uh, my calculus of distinctions, which I've, I've talked about and published the basis of, uh, which says that uh, we live in a quantum or a quantized world. Now, what I'm saying here will be more a stream of consciousness, so it's not going to be perfect, but the concepts are there, and I'll eventually get them down on paper, but I'm just talking uh, uh, the way that it occurred to me here. Um, I was working on the uh, defining the true unit, which, uh, which I call the true unit, which is a nice acronym, but it's the, the real quantum unit in which everything should be measured. Now, if you have a truly quantum unit for mass and energy, the measures of the physical universe, then everything will be integers. In other words, everything will be whole numbers because there can't be any fractions. So in determining what this is, I looked at um, what is the smallest uh, particle in particle physics. What is the smallest particle that makes up common matter that we experience every day in this universe and that we measure, uh, we weigh and measure in terms of its mass and its energy, and that is the electron. And it's well known, the rest mass of the electron is well known. Now, the reason it's called rest mass is because it's not in orbit around an atom, but when it's taken from an atom, stripped from an atom, they call it ionization. If you take the electron off of a, uh, an atom of hydrogen, then that electron is, by itself, is free electron, and its mass is called the rest mass because it's not circling, circling or orbiting around an atom. It is spinning, however. And so the, the uh, challenge was to determine what the size of this uh, electron will be when it's, when it's spinning down to its smallest size and use that as the size for the quantum unit, the true <clears throat> quantum unit. I'll have then the mass, energy, and volume of that truly quantum unit. In doing that and using the equation E equals mc squared, uh, I found that there's a problem with the interpretation of, of um, relativity that when uh, a, the size of something goes to absolute zero, the mass goes to infinity. But when you look at the equation and you determine what the speed of light is, and as Einstein discovered, the speed of light is the limit. So that's the limit to the speed that the, that the uh, electron can spin. But it reaches that speed before it reaches zero. And this is determined uh, by well-known uh, equations uh, and everything, and I've, I've already worked this all out, but what occurred to me was that when you're approaching zero, and I've written about this, the, the um, calculus of Newton and, and Leibniz no longer works because uh, you can't go to absolute zero. There's no such thing as a not as, as a fraction of a quantum. So the quantum of mass and energy 
is the smallest thing that you can have. You can't divide it any farther. That's what quantum means. So when you approach this, you have to say you're, you're approaching the same thing with the volume. It will not go to a volume, and lo and behold, when you do the math, it reaches light speed and its spin before it reaches a mathematical singularity, that is, zero dimension. So that, that point that it reaches, that volume, is the volume of the true quantum unit. But when you calculate this, you find that uh, you are actually um, you're actually bringing uh, relativity and quantum physics together at this point because you're saying we've misunderstood relativity. There's a further adjustment to it. Relativity, uh, the reason it doesn't work at, at the Big Bang and, and extremes is because we're applying the nucleus or the uh, calculus of Newton and Leibniz. We need to apply the, the quantum calculus, which I call the calculus of distinctions, where the smallest thing is the, uh, the uh, electron. When you do that, you find that it cannot go to zero, and the math shows it, and we have that now, and it, it, um, it um, integrates quantum physics and relativity because it takes away that un... Here's where math comes in, where mathematics and, uh, and uh, uh, physics become one and the same. Our mathematics is based on the structure of our universe. The structure of the universe is mathematical. And so when uh, we realize this and we realize that the speed of light has, is a limit, then when we define it as the distance traveled by energy, radiant energy, the distance traveled in over a unit of time, then it's one over one. If we let both time and space approach zero, then we have a mathematically undefined entity. Zero over zero, as any uh, uh, calculus student in college knows, is undefined in mathematics, and that means there is no such thing. So there is no such thing in the real world either. So we're approaching, instead of approaching zero, we're approaching one unit of of space and one unit of time, and one over one is equal to one. So we normalize the speed of light. We've shown the equivalence, uh, energy equivalence of a unit of mass, which we've taken. We've shown that the mass is actually inertia, inertia inertial mass, uh, which is resistance to movement, and the whole thing is then uh, integrated at that point. And so I've brought together now, and I see mathematically, and I'm going to write it all down, uh, how uh, the, the quantization of mass and energy, which was discovered by Planck, and the limit of, the, of light speed discovered by Einstein come together when you're defining a true quantum unit now, why hasn't this been done before? Because the natural units, the Planck units, are not true quantum units. If they were, then you wouldn't have fractions of, um, of the, uh, the unit that, uh, with Planck's constant. The fact that you have fractions everywhere shows you that it's not a true quantum unit. When the true quantum unit is defined based on the, the minimum mass, of the electron, then we can begin to put the whole thing together. And when we uh, do this, we find that there is a third something that while we're measuring mass and energy and space and time, there is something else that enters into the equation in order for there to be stable uh, matter. And that something else, which we've called Gimel in our uh, 
and our TDVP theory developed by Vernon Neffy and myself. Uh, when that something else is put in there and we realize it can't be measured as either mass or energy, but it does uh, contribute to the um, total picture of, the, of any atom, any stable atom that makes up natural um, stuff of the universe, then it all works and we can explain why, what really um, uh, quarks are, why they are the size they are, why they only combine in threes, not two. You can't put two together or four together to make uh, a proton or a neutron. It's always three. This is very easy to prove mathematically. It, uh, it's based on the uh, proof of Fermat's last theorem for n equals 3. It's very solid, uh, proved and provable, and it all works and it explains things that have heretofore not been explained by particle physicists.